So I'll move on to that just now. Hold on. OK, so now you've, you've identified your uh, uh, mayfly larvae. Uh, and what I want to just talk about now is about recording. I'll do a little bit about collecting as well and um, to how you actually get these. Um, and I'm going to cover this in, in all river flies rather than just just mayflies. So th this is the, this is actually the image that got me interested in mayflies. Um, this is uh, from a, a textbook about uh, aquatic ent entomology. And this is a chap, the, the author actually, um, moving mayflies off a bridge over the Mississippi so he can get his car pass. Um, and I just think it's amazing to see how many mayflies there are and the, the fact that like iron filings on his car there, you know, and, and up his legs and things. It would be absolutely astonishing to be stuck in that sort of swarm. Anyway, the, the main method for uh, collecting these specimens is through kick sampling. Um, and this little video here, I'll just show you, I'll just lead you through um, what the what the main this method is. Basically, you're, you're putting a net into the stream and allowing the stream to flow through that net. And as the water is doing that, you're, you're disturbing the bed in front of the, the net and anything that's in there, any uh, detritus um, uh, and mayflies and any anything else in there, silt and all sorts, is getting washed through that net, um, washed into the net and through it. You can then pick up some stones, turn them over, pick off any uh, individuals, rub them, you know, and get them into the net there as well, um, just to get a, a, a anything that's stuck to there. You know, I was saying about Ruthogena being stuck on on some of the stones, that would get them in there. And you do this typically for three. You do the, the kick sampling for three minutes, and then a minute of uh, of uh, stone turning. And here you can see just having a look, don't just think about the middle of the stream, that's where everybody goes to start with, but actually there's some really interesting stuff at the edge. Sometimes you'll get, you know, in a stream that you wouldn't normally get, you get Siphonurus in that area there, you know, for instance, or some of the, the slow water species. You then put the, the, the sample into a bucket or a tray, um, make sure you pick off anything that's on the net, um, so you sometimes get things stuck on there, and you can t you can sort through and take off any, take out any of the bigger detritus that's in the, the, the tree in the bucket and then just pour it into a, a net and then you can start looking through it and picking out the things that you're interested in. Uh, one thing to note is the the all important white plastic spoon because that is probably the best thing that you can use for picking out uh, specimens out of the tree and then having a look at with a hand lens. Uh, for the adults, you can do all sorts of other things. You can you can sweep through um, vegetation. You can use a beating tray. You can use uh, you can get right up close and personal. You know, use a flight net to actually just pick things off of uh, vegetation, and you can use moth traps. We also use things called malaise traps, which are um, uh, less directed, more more indiscriminate, I suppose. And they, you set them up on a flight line and, and you get lots of insects flying along, hitting the central baffle and then going up into a collecting tube. The downside with malaise traps is that you get an awful lot of material. And uh, if you're only looking for mayflies, I wouldn't recommend it. <coughs> the, the plus side is that you can you can have these out for long periods and you can get really detailed information like this from the river test, which shows um, flight periods and actual flight periods. And it shows you things like um, the two big peaks in in uh, Alanitis muticus, Betis muticus, um, and and in Rod Betis rodani, um, the early peak of Betis niger, and and so on. But it also picks up species that you wouldn't normally expect to find. Um, so it's picked up things that might take a long, long time to actually find if you were otherwise looking. And it also picks can pick up weird things happening with. Uh, flight periods like that very late ephemeral and natata. Oh, oh, there's lots going on there. Um, it also picks up that Betis niger is missing in its second peak, which it should have, is missing in this. And that, that's quite interesting because the, uh, there is evidence that if, it, if this species is stressed in some way by some environmental condition, it reverts to a one generation a year. Um, we have a set of recording schemes. We've got, um, whoops, um, we have the riverfly recording schemes, which um, which come together to look at mayflies, stoneflies, and caddisflies. We act as the champions.
for those species. We, we produce identification guides like we've just gone through with the FSC one and training opportunities like this. But the main thing is that we encourage recording and also research and conservation in these species. Um, there's the, the coverage of the schemes we have. Um, uh, you can see that the, the caddis flies have been going the longest and have the most records. Um, they get a lot of records from, from moth trappers and the like as well. Um, Mayfly is second longest with uh, increasing number of records and species as it is. And the stoneflies are kind of lagging behind. Not many people looking at stoneflies um, and certainly not a lot of coverage in Scotland, which is a bit better now. Um, but uh, we, yeah, we've not got as many, but we have got a new key coming out shortly for stoneflies, which might help with that. We also collect evidence. We ask um, questions of people, you know, about different species that we're interesting, interested in. Uh, and it's really useful getting, you know, citizen scientists to go out there and, and collect this sort of information. We did a, a survey looking for the March Brown to try and establish its distribution, because lots of people reckon they've got March Browns, but when when they actually get, when you actually see the specimens, they're, they're not. Um, so we want to work out where they were. We got over 100 new records. Um, we got lots of uh, new places for it. Um, we confirmed that it was still in the River Usk. Well, there was some debate whether it had been dis it disappeared or not. We've got the first records for the wharf in the Eden, first records for Como. Most of the records came with, with photos, which was fantastic, and many of the records came through Twitter, which was a new one for us as well. We ran a survey on, on mayflies a while back as well, looking at getting people to send in mayflies. Um, so we had a fairly select group of people doing this, um, which gave us some really detailed information on, on flight periods at that time. Um, the question about uh, earlier on about when to sample, that, that kind of shows you the bottom graph shows you when you start getting the adults coming off, um, I suppose. Um, so you can see that that period between April and May is probably the time when you're going to get most mature larvae. And again, you can get lots of flight period data. We also looked at um, things like the Yellow May Dunn, which has an uh, interesting uh, emergence strategy. So it's got one generation a year, but it has a, a, a slow growing, um, a fast growing cohort that emerges in, in huge numbers in May and a slow growing cohort that emerges and trickles throughout the year as late as October. And our idea was to ask anglers to record when they saw this really distinctive species. Um, because we want to find out if the the there was a switch in the number that were coming off all in once in May uh, uh, and there was more coming off throughout the year, which does does seem to be unfortunately it didn't really work because anglers just sent us out their, their first record of the year and not the continuing records through the, the year. So it's an important one to think about when you're actually uh, designing a, a survey. We also looked for um, orange striped stonefly, um, which this is, this is a species which um, was uh, was we, we have an endemic species in the UK, and we want to find out if we if all of the species all all the species in in the UK was the same species, and um, so we're looking for specimens for that. The identification guides I mentioned. We went through the pictorial guide to stone uh, to mayflies, but there's also uh, guides to stoneflies and caddisflies. That are available um, and they're all in a really easy simple way they're also really um, affordable as well and we do various other bits of outreach like species postcards and things the we recommend people put their records in through iRecord um, that's the easiest way for us to manage them it also allows a platform for people to have a look at other people's records the the really good thing about iRecord is you can submit photos with it and if you can, if you go on and look at the, the verified um, records, you can go and look for a record of a species you think you might have and then look and see what photographs have been submitted for it. And some of them are fantastic. This is one from Sharon Flint, a record of uh, Dinocras cephalotes. And she's put in a photograph there that gives you all the features that you need to identify it. You know, you've got the the gills under the, the, um, the legs, the gills at the, the end here and the patterning on the body. Um, Perfect for you to go back and have a look at if you if you think you've got it. 
Also fairly active on social media. We do um, stuff on Twitter, um, just round about the uh, throughout the year, just things that we see. So this is a couple of posts, one about um, Cagaronia Pusco Grizia, and the other one from Paul Proctor, who um, uh, always tweets about what adults he's seeing on the river when he's fishing. And I've got a blog that is a bit neglected at the moment, but um, has some ID tips on it. It's it's called mostly about mayflies because sometimes stoneflies sneak into there as well. And finally, here's some useful links uh, for you. There's the Bug Life website there, which has information on on all sorts of uh, freshwater topics and some of the conservation issues. The Riverfly Partnership has a website which has information on, on riverflies on it. That's the link to the blog there um, and the link to iRecord and my Twitter handle. If you want to get in touch with the recording schemes, um, you can get in touch uh, for the Mayfly one is through that, that email address there, or you can phone me on that number there. Um, so that's just, yeah, that's just some information on recording that I thought would be useful for people if they want to take their identification and actually uh, make a difference with their records. Brilliant. Thanks for that, Craig. Um, yeah, a few more questions came through um, after that. Steve has asked, uh, do you need to scrape the sample stones to rub off target sedge larvae or just swill them in the water? Uh, if you're trying to get caddis, that if you're looking for, so some caddis will attach to the stones, so you would have to probably um, pick them off to if you want to look at them in the, in the sample, yeah. Can you see the meeting chat? Brian has asked, um, did, did he not send you a March Brown photo from the River Karen in Sutherland? I think he did, yeah. Was it not on the map? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, gu I'm guessing you missed it if it was. <laughs> yeah, it'll be on iRecord though. Uh, what are my thoughts on the use of lake macroinverts as a water quality index? Um, yeah, it's been it's been talked about before. So um, the uh, uh, what are they called now? Freshwater Habitats Trust. Um, they have uh, they have a, a system called um, oh, PSIM, um, which uh, works for ponds, which you can also you could probably use for for lakes as well, um, depending on the size. The, the thing with lakes is that. There's, there's a lot of microhabitats around a, a lake edge and you, you want to be taking lots of samples. There's other, there's, there are other uh, indices as well. This is the Community Conservation Index, which was developed by Richard Chad and others, which um, looks at the conservation value of different invertebrates. Um, and that can be used to, to compare the communities in different lakes as well. And yeah, good point, Hugh. That's where to put your records in Ireland. Uh, oh yeah, there's a picture of uh, there's Brian Shaw showing off with his March Browns. Um, yeah, that's a March Brown. Yeah, a soft bristle brush to detach live. That's a good good tip there. Um, hope that I get all the EA data from Biasis. I do. Uh, well, yes, I I tend to not take it all at once. I, I, if I've got a particular question, I ask for it. The, the EA have also got a really, if you're interested in what's in your local river and you live in England, the EA have got a really, really good data explorer now online, which allows you to put a line on a map, a square on a map, and then ask it to show you all the invertebrate sampling points and all the invertebrate records. And you can get records back there from, from quite, a, quite a way back. Um, we've used it to have a look for where to where to go and sample for a particular species um, because uh, you know if there's a if sometimes sometimes uh, if you find a species you may think oh well that's usually found within X other species so we can go and have a look um, but yeah it's a it's a really good um, it's a really good tool. Great. Um, it doesn't look like there's any more questions. Whether uh, anybody else 
pops up with any in the meantime we'll wait and see but uh i'd just like to thank you again craig for your time and um your in-depth knowledge into the subject um nobody better place to deliver that talk i don't think um it will be available on youtube um probably in two parts uh well certainly by next week i'll, I'll set about trying to organize the recording and getting it um posted live onto youtube today or tuesday so um it should be available for everybody to look back through if they want a refresher um, a couple of things I shared in the meeting chat a, a moment or two ago. If you want a link to the events page from Bug Life to get some information about events that we have organized over the next couple of months, um, there's a link to that in the meeting chat. You just need to scroll back up through it past all the questions. Um, there's also a link to a survey monkey that there's only four questions within that survey monkey, but it will really help us with um, if you could take a minute or two to fill that out and give us a little bit of feedback about how you felt the event was run today. Um, so, yeah, if uh, many, many thanks uh, coming through on the meeting chat there, Craig. Um, so. Lots of people echoing my uh, my comments. Well, thank you for all your excellent questions as well. Some of those put me on the spot a bit. I'm going to have to <laughs> and read, read up on some of those things. Yeah, it's good good to see that we had uh, lots of engagement. Obviously, a lot of people um, really enjoying enjoying what you had to share with us, Craig. So, um, OK, fantastic. If there's nothing else, then thank you very much, everybody, for attending. Um, like I said, follow those links in the meeting chat. I think you'll be able to access them um, once you've left anyway. But um, uh, yeah, if you can get booked on to one of the future events as soon as possible because the spaces are limited and they they do become fully booked quite quickly. So um, hopefully we'll see you at one of the, the next events soon. OK. Thanks very much, everybody. And thanks again, Craig. Thank you, Craig.